So Credo has been growing very well, but uh, growth comes with associated challenges for us. Uh, uh, we have a great product market fit in the space that we're working in. We know the schools, we know the requirements, we know the needs, we know how children need to be educated in only US. But uh, being a model which is people intensive, which is touch point intensive, brings about its own set of challenges because uh, we need, we are not just here providing a set of books, a set of materials, or just a set of training courses to teachers. We have a very close touch point with schools, we have a close relationship with them, we tend to uh, go fairly out of the way to ensure that our implementation is a success because finally what we judge ourselves, what we measure ourselves on is how well the children have learned. So if the children have not learned, if the outcomes are not met, then whatever we do is kind of pointless. So that is a big challenge because uh, considering that you know we have to bring in multiple elements together including the stakeholders which are the owner, the teacher, the parents and the child itself uh, brings about a lot of challenges for us in, this, in our implementation. So that's, that's the biggest challenge we face. Uh, it's, it's something that we know what to do, uh, it's a constant challenge, so we're constantly working towards process, uh, you know, techniques, using a lot of tech, um, dashboards, data to ensure that we can actually implement better these skills. So that's, that's a, the main challenges that we have as of now. It is a people intensive business, so managing people, especially on the field, we have people visiting schools once in a month, uh, you know, and they're all, all on the field, so managing a large field force also has a lot of challenges associated to it. So the first uh, pitch is, the, uh, actually we promise four things to our customers, four important uh, USPs. The first is the outcomes that we produce. Um, the, the, the target segment that we are, we are targeting in terms of the schools uh, are the lower income, the affordable private schools. There the parents don't have any recourse to learning at home. They're completely dependent on the school. The pa they're putting uh, probably two, three months of the salary into the school child's education in that private school, choosing them over a free government school. The demand on the school to deliver outcome is very high. So that's where we fit in very well because outcomes is something we commit to the schools. It's the first unique proposition that we provide with much better outcomes, much better learning outcomes, especially in foundational years because most of these children, as they grow into grade four, grade five, and the higher grades, they start struggling because the foundation is not very well set. So learning outcomes in the foundational year is the first USP that we have. The second is uh, whenever Credo grows into a school, uh, uh, there's a marked increase in admissions the school gets. Thanks to the fact that you know we set up the infrastructure, we set up a credo lab, we train them to deliver better outcomes. Uh, this gives a lot of uh, ability for the school to market themselves better. So they typically see anywhere between 30 to 100 percent jump in admissions the moment a credo solution gets into a school. So that's the second USP. Uh, the third USP is we help the teachers implement the curriculum, achieve far, far higher outcomes, and also ensure that we don't burden them while doing so. Since we are doing a play-based learning approach, the play takes over. The children are learning through play. That Teacher's burden is not is just to facilitate the play, but not to actually teach. So that reduces the burden on the teacher. So that's a big third USP because in this space, especially lower income communities in the affordable private schools, attrition is a big problem. School uh, teacher attrition is a big problem. Teachers are not paid very well, so they need to be constantly motivated to deliver. So that's where we fit in because we mentor, support the teachers, and we ensure that they are able to achieve these outcomes without having to take on extra burden. The final last proposition to the school is the brand that we built for the school in the community because each of these are uh, neighborhood schools running in a small community and they really value the brand that they build in that, in that space. So when they partner with us, we really go out of the way to ensure that their brand gets built in the eyes of the parents. So that's, that's, those are the four main selling points for us as far as the schools are concerned. So uh, Credo started in 2012. Uh, we have partnered with more than 2,500 schools to date. Um, we have we've had I mean, approximately about 500,000 children go through this curriculum. So we believe this is a tremendous impact in terms of you know, the next generation of learners that have come through this Credo program. Um, our mission in the future is, uh, in the next two years, is to reach a million children. That's the kind of impact we want to create. In that annual year, we want a million children to be on the Credo platform learning through the Credo curriculum. So that's kind of our ambitious target uh, and grow further from there. So. Uh, that's, that's kind of what the impact numbers we're looking to achieve. We are not a tech first company. Um, we are a physical you know, education company, bricks and mortar to a large extent. Um, but tech plays a big role in our solution. Tech is a great enabler for us. So we look at tech in multiple stakeholders uh, in terms of how we address the needs of every stakeholder. So the first is the in-school uh, stakeholders, which are your teachers, owners, 
and how do we address their needs. So we have a Credo 60 app which goes into every teacher's hands where they actually know the daily timetable, they understand the activities they need to do on a daily basis, the assessments are recorded in the app, the progress reports, the skill matrix, the remedials, everything come out of the app. So that's a big enabler for the teacher to ensure they can implement better with the Credo curriculum. The owners themselves get to understand how well the school is performing, how well the children are learning, how well the teachers are performing. So they get a very good dashboard, very good view into what uh, what the school itself is, the earliest program, how well it's running in the school. So that's the second stakeholder we address. The third stakeholder in this is outside the school is a parent. Uh, how We actually have the 60 app enabled now to go to the parent communication also. So how the school being able to communicate to parents what they're doing, parents being able to see the progress of the child is, is basically how we use technology. Uh, the fourth uh, stakeholder in this is a child, so we recently launched our own app called Gamified Learning app called Practico where children can actually play games and learn on the mobile, so active learning on the mobile which is mapped to the activities they do in the school, so that's kind of uh, you know adds on to the learning that they get, so that's the, that's the way we use technology. The last stakeholder for us which is very important is our own people, our own implementing implementation team that goes to these schools, so we use technology extensively to ensure that our processes are uh, well monitored, uh, the schools are the, 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 the active, the process that we need to follow in terms of implementation in every school is actually done very well and you know constantly monitor that, that's something we use a lot of tech for internally. So tech has, tech is a great enabler for all of, for all these things for us and uh, we see this growing further and you know uh, with also things like AI, we are in fact experimenting with an AI chatbot to see how we can actually uh, you know, uh, provide ready-made instant uh, answers to queries that the teachers may raise uh, from our own uh, data, from our own knowledge repository. Looking at other ways of uh, looking at, you know, how to do speech to uh, text to speech, speech to text. How can we capture? These are very young children we're talking about. So, can we have games where we record what the child speaks and actually try to give them a benchmark comparison on how well they're doing? So, multiple things around that. Um, so. Uh, Technology is a great enabler. You're not a tech first company, but tech is a blended uh, component of our solution pretty much across the board. And so whenever we have tech, any tech enabled solution that you put in, uh, you're going to get a lot of data. Um, so for us, the first data element is again in terms of the child's learning outcome. So that's where we start, that's what we're committing to. So how well are we capturing the data related to the outcome is something that we, we focus on. Um, so there are multiple means that by which we capture the data, so then our implementation manager goes there, they collect data, the school itself is recording their assessments on their app, so there's a data going there, so multiple uh, inputs are there to this, so we actually collate that information and try to see how well children are doing, how well the schools are doing in terms of outcomes. The second uh, uh, data element that we look at is uh, in terms of teacher's performance uh, itself uh, and, and sectional performance and everything like how well is a grade and a section doing in a school. So that is extremely important for us from a data point of view. Uh, and for us internally we use a lot of data to actually understand the data that's coming in from each of these elements like practical gaming app, children are playing, there are difficulties they face, uh, you know capturing every stroke that the child actually goes through and seeing where they're getting held up and putting that into a data analysis so that we know which are the typical problems children face in early years uh, is, is also something that we are looking at uh, going forward. Uh, and also a lot of data for internally managing account health, school health dashboards so that we know where things can go wrong. Being more predictive in nature and proactive in nature uh, is where we see a lot of data being used, uh, not being reactive. Uh, reactive is always there, you have your process, you have ticketing systems, etc. to take care of that. But being how, how can we be predictive and proactive is where we will use a lot of data for. Uh, we are into, uh, our punchline says democratize quality early education. You know, um, there are uh, 250 million children in the country, out of which probably 150 million are in the, below the age of 8. 6 and 8 and uh, to touch them to actually ensure that this kind of education reaches every nook and corner of the country itself is a massive, massive effort. Uh, I think if we achieve 10% of what we set out to achieve that itself will be a massive change in the, in the education landscape we are looking at. So our aim for the next 10 years is to do what we are doing, get better at what we are doing. Foundational learning is where we are, where we will continue to be. So uh, children between the age of 3 to 10, 3 to 11, that's 2 to 11, that's our focus area. How do we ensure children are learning better and all means and all methodologies, play-based learning, technology, books, anything that goes into it to ensure that children can learn better is where we are going to be. Uh, well, geographically we could spread out. Um, right now we're focused on India but we do get a lot of inquiries from other places, other, other countries uh, where similar problems exist like India where there is a learning poverty in foundational years. 
so you know we could be looking at uh, other geographies going forward but our pretty much our aim and focus is going to be in this space uh, teacher skilling uh, and and learning outcomes with children i think that's going to be the two main focus areas for us uh, for fairly long amount of time Uh, on the learning uh, on the outcome part we also are looking at uh, one of the important benchmarks for us is how well we are doing better than market uh, so like we've been measured 3 years back by fsg to be 50% better than market in terms of outcomes that we produced in schools uh, in the next 2 3 years pandemic has been a big blip because of the fact that uh, you know children learning outcomes have significantly dipped in the last 2 years but right now our target for the next 2 3 years is to ensure that we uh, are better than 80% better than market in terms of our outcomes that's one thing and uh, you know be at least 3 to 4 times better than any of the market benchmarks that asr or any of these uh, reports have put in in terms of what uh, outcomes are being actually achieved in various uh, quarters in this country so that's one of our outcome benchmarks if you want to keep constantly being better than the market uh, constantly that's that's one of the we're working on um so caspian i think we started interacting with them last year um uh, so we we basically uh, ours is a working capital in the intensive industry because of the cyclical nature of the company of the business itself where from august to february you are actually investing in the business you are actually you are investing in your sales cycle you are investing in inventory you are investing in books and then you actually uh, end up getting the sales and revenue post march of the subsequent year which means that uh, we need a lot of support in terms of uh, working capital requirements which are very short term in nature uh, these are not necessarily long term working capital but very short term working capital requirements and uh, so we've been uh, constantly looking at uh, uh, providers that would help us in this and uh, aspin has been a great support because they actually structured a product that works very well for us uh, we we are not interested in a long term business term loan which doesn't work for us for our kind of business since the cyclical nature we constantly have requirements where 6 months we need the cash 6 months we are cash rich again 6 months we need the cash so a working capital a revolving credit kind of facility is what we were looking at and there were not too many institutions being able to provide us that especially in a unsecured manner uh so uh, caspian was the only uh, was the first institution to actually come up with a product like that i think there was a lot of customization done for our kind of business which was something great to see because we've not seen too many lending institutions trying to customize or build products based on what the customer needs uh so that was interesting for us uh, that was great to help uh, so we continue to use the credit line as and when we need it and you know we can keep on rotating it as we go forward so that's that's i think been a brilliant uh, thing to work with caspian on uh it's been very smooth uh it was very intensive uh, which is good uh, we had we had a lot of queries that uh, came up with caspian and uh, we i think the technology interface was very convenient because we just had to upload documents there um, otherwise it, it it there's a lot of you know we create these data rooms and we start populating an intensive amount of data and you know it does uh, doesn't go anywhere a lot of times you've seen when we work with other lenders so the, the interface was great for us to just kind of upload stuff and you know a lot of queries that we had we could actually go through the process very seamlessly integration with everything like you know providing any gst details etc everything was very seamless in a lot of ways that was good for us uh, in terms of uh, ensuring that uh, uh, we understood uh, what were the steps required at every level i think caspian was very clear in terms of you know what needs to be done what would be the next steps that was a good good seamless process we found uh, the diligence was good um it was intensive uh, but it was great in terms of also helping us uh, you know think about certain things uh, typically when you do all this uh, like you do a cash flow projection or you do a projection in terms of when you exactly need the money um you don't end up thinking so much in detail you just put a broad level requirement but uh, caspian came back with a lot of pointers there on where and how it could be structured so that was very helpful so uh, i think it was all in all a great uh, uh, thing to look at in terms of how how to go about a diligence process so i think the fundamental problem uh, in the country uh, today and this is not just lower income middle income higher income wherever you look at uh the last focus of the society is on early education uh when we talk of education you talk of the venture capital industry or you talk about private equity or you talk about funding that goes in you talk about government schemes most of it is focused on higher education it's about grade 5 onwards grade 6 onwards what are we doing you know we're doing test prep we're doing this we're doing that we're putting tuitions in place just not thinking about how to fix foundational learning 
um, that is the biggest problem today and if that doesn't get fixed you're going to get society uh, i mean generations after generations of learners who are not going to be learners who are going to struggle um, that's that's fundamentally the biggest problem and I, i'm not saying this because i am in the early education industry but i think it's a big big problem to solve for it's something that the western countries especially the european countries have done very well in um the focus on early education the focus on the right foundation for the child and then kind of take them off from there is is something that they understand very well i think we as a country we as parents don't understand it uh, most parents don't even bother about early education they look at it and say oh you know what let the child have fun let them have a good time even i'm talking about higher income parents mostly in fact and they look at it and then the child is in grade 4 grade 5 you suddenly realize the academic standards start dipping and then you start focusing you start pushing you pressurize the child the t- the brain development of the child is maximum between the age of 2 and 10 that's a time when the child wants to learn has the capacity to learn has the ability to learn we ignore that phase of the child's life and then when the child is actually the brain is fairly developed and you know the brain, neuronic connections or whatever we call it is actually intelligence is already developed trying to push very hard and trying to get the child to learn from grade 5 grade 6 onwards where the golden period is already gone um i think and fundamentally if there is no awareness campaign if there is no fundamental awareness of how important early education is for the whole society and these are all unfortunately long term processes you know it's not something you will see instant results and in. um it's not something that you know so i just put up a test prep and i increase je uh, numbers from 100 to 200 i mean that's that's going to be very easy to prove this is generational to invest in early education to invest in foundational and learning is actually generational unfortunately there is not enough capital enough mindset enough number of people wanting to do this over a long period of time so i think uh, fundamentally i want to end this with that uh, the thought for all of us to know what it is to focus on learning focus on the right kind of early foundational learning is going to just make a phenomenal difference i think there are enough record enough uh, studies and research that prove that but no developing country i'm not just talking about india most developing countries don't seem to see that as a problem so